Hello and welcome to the Maryland Department of Juvenile Services Prison Rape Elimination Act training. My name is Lauren Jenkins and I'll be your instructor for the duration of this training. If you're watching this video, you're either a DJS employee, your contracted provider, or a volunteer with our agency and are required to take this training. During this training, we'll cover four modules. In Module 1, we will discuss the introduction to the Standards of Prison Rape Elimination Act. We will also discuss the zero tolerance policy our agency has in place, and also discuss the requirements as a mandated reporter. In Module 2, we will cover the intake process of our youth, and also youth and staff's rights to be free from retaliation. In Module 3, we'll discuss the dynamics of sexual abuse, sexual harassment, and common reactions of sexual abuse victims. Also, we'll discuss how to detect and respond to sexual abuse. In Module 4, we'll talk about how to fulfill our duties when responding to sexual abuse. Upon completion of each module, there is a required test to be completed. All right, let's get started with Module 1. In Module 1, we'll review the training objectives. We're going to introduce and explain background information on the Prison Rape Elimination Act, also referred to as PREA, and the PREA standards. Provide information on relevant laws regarding the applicable age of consent. Introduce our zero tolerance policy for sexual abuse and sexual harassment. And provide information on how to comply with relevant laws related to the mandatory reporting of sexual abuse to outside authorities. So what is PREA? The Prison Rape Elimination Act was created to provide a zero tolerance for prison rape by using a variety of tools. It was passed by Congress in 2003. It establishes a zero tolerance policy for all forms of sexual abuse and sexual harassment. It increases accountability of staff who fail to detect, prevent, and reduce pun and punish prison rape. PREA also makes prevention a top priority in each correctional system, and it protects Eighth Amendment rights of each federal, state, and local resident. PREA also provides standardized definitions used for collecting data on the incidences of rape. It increases available data and information on incidents in order to improve management and administration. PREA develops and implements national standards for detection, prevention, reduction, and punishment. And it also establishes grant programs to fund PREA compliance. PREA standards deal with prevention planning, responsive planning, training and education, screening for risk of sexual victimization and abusiveness, and reporting. It also deals with official response following a resident report, investigations, discipline, medical and mental health care, and data collection and review. According to the Maryland Criminal Law Title 3.3, sexual crimes establishes an age of consent. In the state of Maryland, one must be 16 years or older to consent to sexual activity. With regards to youth in confined settings, Maryland Criminal Law 314 subparagraph C states that a person may not engage in sexual contact, vaginal intercourse, or any sexual act with an individual confined in a child care institution licensed by the department. This includes facilities such as a detention center or even a treatment facility. So how do we as staff respond to situations of sexual abuse that, that may occur in our facilities? One way that we should not respond is that in, a, in light of a situation, we should never just assume that there's always a few bad apples. Staff's mentality about resident on resident abuse needs to really be proactive. Unfortunately, some share this belief that, well, sometimes youth get what they deserve or they should have thought about that before they committed a crime. This, according to Priya, is not acceptable. Accepting the few bad apples theory or believing that sexual abuse is just a part of the punishment virtually will ensure that the abuse will continue. Ensuring safe and positive facility climates and healthy, effective staff-resident relationships will have the greatest opportunity in our agency preventing sexual abuse and sexual harassment. So this leads to our next section in this module, dealing with organizational culture. So what is organizational culture? Organizational culture is the sums of the organization's attitudes, beliefs, values, norms, and prejudices that can cause an organization to essentially do what it does. Let's really break down these terms. So attitudes. 
Attitudes are learned predispositions to respond in a consistently favorable or unfavorable manner with respect to a given object. Beliefs are shared explanations of experiences. A lot of times we see that we receive our beliefs from how we are raised or how we're grown up. Values is what is considered what is right and good and the way things ought to be. Norms are shared rules, essentially the way things are completed. And prejudice are ill-formed or irrational opinions of somebody or something. If institutionalized, prejudices are embedded in the procedures, policies, or even objectives of an organization. So to put it very simply, organizational culture is how culture reacts when no one is watching. When we fail to maintain professionalism, we create unhealthy working environments. One type of unhealthy working environment is a sexualized work environment. Characteristics of a sexual work environment include undue or over-familiarity between staff and residents, staff and staff relationships that have become unprofessional, staff and resident relationships that have crossed boundaries, staff and off-duty conduct where it impacts the work. Here's an interesting statistic. In a recent training conducted with correctional professionals, about 84% of the class indicated that they have discussed personal issues in front of residents, sometimes or frequently. It's important to understand that staff, cultural, and norms are clear indicators of what residents are witnessing and how they will develop their own beliefs about what is acceptable and what is not. A sexualized work environment creates serious boundary issues. Therefore, it is important that all professionals maintain healthy boundaries and their professionalism. This leads to our zero tolerance policy. According to PREA standard 115.311, it states that there will be a zero tolerance policy against any sexual abuse and sexual harassment. Each agency will have a PREA coordinator with sufficient authority and time to oversee the agency's PREA compliance. Where an agency operates more than one facility, each facility shall also designate a PREA compliance manager with sufficient time and authority to oversee their facility's PREA compliance. The Maryland Department of Juvenile Services has zero tolerance for the commission of sexual abuse and harassment against any youth in its custody by another youth or even staff that includes staff not only working directly with the agency, but also licensed and contracted residential programs. This zero tolerance policy affects all adults and youth who work, volunteer, reside, and visit any DJS programs. DJS establishes this policy to prohibit and prevent sexual abuse and harassment and to detect, report, investigate, and address any allegations of abuse and harassment involving any youth in the custody of DJS or any of its licensed or contracted residential programs. Again, DJS has a zero tolerance for sexual abuse or sexual harassment to any of its youth or staff. So take a moment and think about what are some examples of sexual abuse and sexual harassment? In the next few slides, we will discuss those things. According to DJS policy, sexual abuse encompasses youth on youth sexual activity, youth on youth sexual harassment, staff on youth sexual activity, and staff on youth sexual harassment. Sexual abuse is any activity that involves sexual molestation or the exploitation of a youth, including rape or sexual offense in any degree sodomy and unnatural or perverted sexual practices, voyeurism and indecent exposure, and any other sexual assault, contact, or fondling. So let's talk about sexual abuse regarding youth on youth. According to the definition, this includes the following acts. If a victim does not consent, is coerced in such acts by overt or implied threats of violence, or is unable to consent or refuses. Again, youth in our confined settings or under our care are not able by law to consent to sexual activity. Such activity of sexual abuse includes contact between the penis and the vulva, 
or the penis and the anus, including penetration, however slight. Contact between the mouth and the penis, vulva, or anus. Penetration of the anal or genital opening of another person, however slight. It can either be done by hand, finger, object, or other instruments. Sexual abuse is also defined as any other intentional touching, either directly through the clothing of the genitalia, anus growing, breasts, inner thigh, or the buttocks of any person. This does, however, exclude contact incidental to a physical altercation. This next slide looks at sexual abuse of a resident by a DJS employee, an employee of a contracted program, or even a volunteer. You will see similarities in regards to the definitions. Again, this includes the following acts, contact between the penis and the vulva or the penis and the anus, including penetration, however slight. Contact between the mouth and the penis, vulva, or anus. This also includes contact between the mouth and any body part where the DJS employee, employees of a contracted program or volunteer, has the intent to abuse, arouse, or gratify sexual desire. So penetration of the anal or genital opening, however slight, by hand, finger, object, or other instrument, that is unrelated to the official duties of a DJS employee, employee of a contracted program, or volunteer, and that is used for the intent to arouse or yield sexual gratification is considered sexual abuse. Also, any other intentional contact, either directly through the clothing of or with the genitalia, anus, growing breasts, inner thigh, or the buttocks, unrelated to DJS duties, is considered sexual abuse. It is important to understand that any attempt, threat, or request by a DJS employee, employees of a contracted program provider, or volunteer to engage in such activities described in paragraphs 1 through 5 of this section are prohibited. Another act of sexual abuse is voyeurism. In the next slide, we'll look at the definition of what voyeurism is. It is important to understand that voyeurism by any DJS employee, employee of a contracted program, or volunteer is prohibited. Voyeurism defined is any invasion of privacy of a youth by a DJS employee, employee of a contracted program provider, or a DJS volunteer for reasons unrelated to their official duties. Some examples of voyeurism include peering at a youth who is using the toilet in his or her room to perform bodily functions, requiring a youth to expose his or her buttocks, genitals, or breasts, or taking images of all or parts of a youth's naked body or of a youth performing a bodily function. So let's look at the definition of sexual harassment. Sexual harassment means any repeated and unwelcome sexual advances, requests for sexual favors or verbal comments, gestures, or acts of derogatory or offensive sexual nature by one youth or resident directed towards another youth or resident and repeated verbal comments or gestures of a sexual nature to a youth by a DJS employee, an employee of a contracted program, or even a volunteer. This can include demeaning references to gender or sexual orientation. An example of that would be if you were addressing a male resident and you stated to him repeatedly, stop acting like a little girl. That would be considered sexual harassment. Some other examples of sexual har harassment include sexually suggestive or derogatory comments about body or clothing, or obscene language or gestures, any unwelcome sexual advances, and any requests for sexual favors directed to a youth by another youth or a staff directing that to a youth. According to PREA standard 115.361, this standard requires all staff to immediately report any knowledge, suspicion, or information regarding an incident. To also report any retaliation against residents or staff who have reported. And if staff have neglected or violated their responsibilities that may have contributed to an incident or even an incident of retaliation. According to PREA standard 115.351, this standard requires our agency to provide residents with a way to report to an entity that is not a part of our agency, to use the youth telephone system phones, and the 1-800 number that is found on PREA posters located throughout the entire facilities, 
and also to have access to call the Rape Crisis Hotline. The Code of Maryland Family Law Article 5-701 to Article 5-715 and Comar Regulation 07.02.07 requires an individual who has reason to believe that a child has been abused or neglected shall immediately notify a local law enforcement agency and the local Department of Social Services Child Protective Services Division. You can see on this slide, mandated reporters are listed. That includes human service workers, any professional employees of a juvenile services, that includes your transportation officers, your food service workers, and also your case management specialists, probation and parole officers. In addition to mandatory reporting obligations, when any employee receives an allegation of abuse, it is important that they report that information only to staff who need to know about it. This information is outlined in our agency's policies and procedures, and we will discuss this further throughout the duration of this training. Also, it is important for medical and mental health professionals to specifically inform the residents about their duty to report. Best practice is to establish this with them at the beginning of any initial meeting or screening. Upon receiving an allegation of abuse, all facility direct care staff must immediately notify a shift commander, supervisor, or facility administrator. Medical and mental health should be notified the Office of Inspector General, Maryland State Police, and all other notifications listed on our incident reporting forms, they should be contacted. Transportation may also need to be notified, especially if a youth needs to be taken off grounds. We have reached the end of Module 1. Just to review our objectives, we introduced and explained the background information on PREA and the PREA standards, provided information on the relevant laws regarding the applicable age of consent, introduced the zero tolerance policy for sexual abuse and sexual harassment, and provided information on how to comply with the relevant laws related to mandated reporting of sexual abuse to outside authorities. At this time, please take a moment to review the next few slides that will provide references in regards to the PREA standards we covered in Module 1. Upon completion of reviewing those slides, you will be ready to take your exam for module one.